Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna. The eldest of the four Grand Duchesses, Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna was born in the third, Old Style, or 15th of November 1895, at Tsarsko Selo, just outside of St. Petersburg, to Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra. Dark, blonde-haired, and blue-eyed as described by people who knew her, Olga was easily the most intelligent of the sisters, loving to read books, and she was known for her compassionate heart and was very thoughtful. She could also be stubborn and have a bit of a temper and could be the merriest of the merry. She was also very emotional and sensitive. One of the children's nannies, Margareta Igar, recalled that in 1899 when Olga, then four, and her two sisters, Tatiana, then two and Maria, then two months old, were sitting posing for a portrait painter who was painting their pictures and Olga, who soon got bored, lost her patience and stood up and told the painter, you are a very ugly man and I don't like you one bit, to which he responded, you are the first lady who has ever said I was ugly and moreover, I'm not a man, I'm a gentleman. And Igar, who witnessed this, was dying of laughter. Olga also played the piano very well and she was very musical. It was noted she sang prettily in a mezzo-soprano voice by Sophie Bucks Hoofden, a lady-in-waiting to the Empress. She also enjoyed poetry and writing, and her favorite perfume was the rose perfume. She also had a small cat named Vaska, and her name day was on the 11th July. Olga, like her sisters, was called by her patronymic, Olga Nikolaevna, by friends, family, and servants, and not by their full titles. She and her siblings were brought up as simply as possible. They slept on hard camp cots, unless they were ill, and had to take cold baths every morning. Olga and her younger sister, Tatiana, were often referred to as the big pair. The two sisters were very close, despite Olga having a more spontaneous, open personality, and Tatiana being more laid back and calm. They were said to be more like best friends than sisters and shared a room and dressed alike. Olga was most like her father in looks and she was also very close to him. She was allowed access to the newspapers and would discuss what was going on in Russia with her father. She also enjoyed long walks with him. One day during Eastertide, we were out driving on the Nevsky Prospect and the little Grand Duchess Olga was not good. I was speaking to her, trying to induce her to sit down quietly, when suddenly she did so, folding her hands in front of her. In a few seconds, she said to me, Did you see that policeman? I told her that was nothing extraordinary, and that the police would not touch her. She replied, But this one was writing something. I was afraid he might have been writing, I saw Olga, and she was very naughty. Olga very much enjoyed her schooling, and enjoyed learning very much. Her subjects, some of them including French, history, art, Russian, English, and arithmetic. Pierre Guillard, her French tutor, notes that she started her studies at the age of 10, and he said of her, The eldest, Olga, possessed a remarkably quick brain. She had good reasoning powers as well as initiative, a very independent manner, and a gift for swift and entertaining repartee. She gave me a certain amount of trouble at first, but our early skirmishes were soon succeeded by relations of frank cordiality. She picked up everything extremely quickly and always managed to give an original turn to what she learnt. But he also noted of her, Olga Nikolaevna did not fulfill the hopes I had set upon her. Her fine intellect failed to find the elements necessary to its development. Instead of making progress, she began to go back. When Olga grew up to be a teenager, her mother, the Empress Alexandra, kept reminding Olga that she had to set an example to her younger siblings. Alexandra told her that she must be polite to the servants who looked after her and did their best to help her, and that she should not make her nurse nervous when she was tired and not feeling well, and Olga responded that she would try to do better. In the year 1909, Olga received her regiment, the 3rd Elizabeth Gradsky Hussars Regiment. 
The uniform was a blue tunic with gold braiding and a red skirt, which has survived. She finally got to review her regiment on the 5th August 1913, as she noted in her diary. At 10.30, the two of us in uniforms went to the training grounds. We rode on horses. I rode on Regent. Tatiana on Robino. Uncle Nikolasha rode with me to my regiment. Martinov met me with a report. Then I galloped to the trumpet players, greeted each squadron, and met Papa on the right flank. Then I followed him around the front again. I was so nervous about the entrance, but it turned out okay. The parade was nice and beautiful. My great Yelisavit Gardsky regiment marched very well. After breakfast, talked on the balcony and took group pictures with Papa and my officers in front of the big palace. Then took pictures with the regiment ladies. It's very sad that Mama could not be here. At 3.30, both regiments came to our garden. Mama was sitting in the carriage with Alexei. The singers were singing nice songs as the regiment marched by. Papa and we saw them to the gate, and regiment marched past Papa for the last time. The hussars and officers are so sweet, although I don't know them, but still. They presented me with an album picturing the best views of Olga's headquarters. I liked the Lieutenant Colonel and Sultan Trey most of all. Had dinner with Mama and Aunt, had tea with them as well, with Papa and Dimitri. There was an Austrian dinner. Attended Vespers. Aunt left at ten. We saw her off to the station. Heard the regimental march and singing from afar. Such sweethearts. They really pleased us. It's very hot today. It was 34 in the sun in the morning at Kranz Noeselo. I'm so incredibly happy with today. In 1916, she also received another regiment, which she never got to review due to the war revolution, the 2nd Kubansky Platostunsky Battalion Regiment. In 1911, Olga turned 16, the age considered to be the coming out age, meaning she had to put her hair up and wear long skirts, and a great ball was held at Lividia for this occasion. The speculation on everyone's lips was, who was she going to marry? Prince Christopher of Greece asked Nicholas for Olga's hand in marriage in early 1914, but Nicholas had soon said to him, kind but firm, as he stated that Olga was too young for marriage. Nicholas's choice was the son of Queen Marie of Romania and King Ferdinand of Romania, Prince Carol. In year 1914, the imperial family made a visit to Romania on their yacht, the Standard. However, Olga struggled to even make small talk with him and did not want to marry him, and according to Pierre Gilliard, wanted to marry a Russian and remain Russian. She also fell in love with an officer on the Standard, Pavel Voronov. When she was about 18 and when he eventually got married, she wrote in her diary on his wedding day, God grant him good fortune, my beloved. It's sad, distressing. The Empress was also sent an official proposal by Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, the Elder, for Olga's hand in marriage to Maria's son, Boris Vladimirovich. Boris was older than Olga and was well known in many circles, and the proposal was rejected, and according to Anna Virobova, the Empress was reduced to mortified tears. During the war, Olga, her sister Tatiana, and her mother became nurses and begun to treat wounded soldiers. For Olga, seeing the soldiers was very emotional for her and took its toll on her nerves and made her very nervous and overtired, so she was soon was assigned an office job in October 1915. During her time in the hospital, though, Olga often wrote in her diary about Mitya, and according to Valentina Chebotareva, Mitya was a weeder named Dmirti Chakbagov. She would talk to him regularly, and when he left the hospital, get very upset. When she received messages from him, she got very excited. However, there were some reports that he showed the other officers letters Olga had written to him while he was drunk. In early 1917, Olga and her siblings were struck down with the measles, and all became every sick. By that time, Russia was in the middle of a revolution, and soon her father abdicated in March 1917, bringing the 304-year-old Romanov dynasty to a very abrupt end. 
The family were then put under house arrest in the Alexander Palace. Olga had lost all her bright spirits and had aged quite a bit. In August 1917, the entire family left Tsarsko Selo and were transferred to the town of Tobolsk in Siberia, staying in the governor's mansion, Pierre Gilliard being one of the many people with them. Nicholas and Alexandra left Tobolsk for the city of Yekaterinburg with their daughter, Maria, in April 1918, leaving Olga, Tatiana, Anastasia, and Alexei, who at the time was unwell, behind in Tobolsk with their tutors, Pierre Gilliard, Charles Sidney Gibbes, and other servants. Eventually, in May 1918, Olga and her siblings made their last journey to join their family at the Ipatiev House in Yekaterinburg in May 1918 aboard the ferry, the Rus. Her last known photograph was taken on the Rus, showing her gazing out into the distance. At the Apatiev house, all cameras were taken off of them, so no photos of Olga or her family in the Apatiev house exist today. Gilliard and Gibbous did not join them in Yekaterinburg. During her time in the Apatiev house, Olga became very withdrawn from everyone and became even thinner. Her short life of 22 years ended in the early hours of the morning of 17th July 1918, when the entire family and other residents of the household, including Dr. Botkin and Anna Demidova, the lady-in-waiting to the empress, were murdered by the Bolsheviks in the cellar of the Apatyev house, bring the lives of every in the household to an abrupt end. Olga Nikolaevna was 22 years old. If you enjoy this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share my videos for more videos like these. Anyways, I love you guys, and see you guys in the next video.